Welcome to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast, where we seek to encourage and equip you in your walk with Christ by exploring a variety of biblical and theological topics. Stay tuned to the end of the episode to learn how you can submit a question for us to answer on the podcast. Welcome back to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast. My name is Toby Baxley, and I am your host, joined today by Murray Van Gundy, who is back after a two-week absence. And <laughs> sorely I was, I was here sorely last week. Y'all weren't here last week. Right. Uh, Chris McKnight sorely and missed. Scott Christensen. So we're back with uh, part, I don't know, this is part four of our series of the uh, Steve Swartz book, uh, A Biblical Examination of Divorce for Abandonment and Abuse. It's a catchy title. Uh, uh, Really draws. It's it's really going to sell well (laughs) on that It's going to look good on that shelf. Well, don't leave out the subtitle. Oh, what was the subtitle? Foundational Issues and the Exegetical Connection. Between abuse and abandon. Yeah. He's it's, a Puritan. He's yeah, downright Puritan. Puritan right there. It's a whole paragraph for a <laughs> book title. Uh, but we are we are discussing chapters 8 through 13 today. It's the tail end of part 2. And uh, as we finished last week, uh, Chris mentioned that we have about 40 pages of caution. Uh, so we want to talk about the that caution, the, the great need for caution before you just jump into run into the courthouse to file for divorce. Um, so, uh, all right, Scott, you're in charge. I'm yes. in charge. Yes. <laughs> Chris is in charge. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a humble you're just facilitator. Picking, you just get to <laughs> pick, you just pick, you're just picking where we lunch. That's, that's right. That's, that's your right. only responsibility today. That's right. Well, that's a right. big responsibility. It, it can, by the way. It yeah. can be. Yes, it's always a little sketchy when it's Murray's turn. It is. I have to be honest. It might be, it might be a construction site. It, it might be. It, you just never know where we're going to go. I'm going to find a taco yeah. truck. At we're a gonna, I was, that's site. just what I was thinking. We're awesome. going to brown bag it down by the river. <laughs> it's always, it's uh, always an adventure. Well, I'll jump in. Uh, as we begin with Chapter 8, It's uh, he, he titles it, Before You Jump to Conclusions, The Great Need for Caution. And what you think is going to come right away is caution on hold up on getting divorced, and that does come. That's 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 coming. Mm-hmm. But he actually has a caution before that caution, and it's basically this. He says before making the blanket assertion that all divorce is wrong, it might be prudent to remember that God Himself is divorced. And he lists several Old Testament passages: uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, etc. That talks about when God divorced Israel and then he divorced Judah. In fact, God said to Judah, I sent her away with a decree of divorce. Isaiah 51 speaks of the certificate of divorce with which God sent his disobedient people away. Uh, Ezekiel 23, 9 and Hosea chapter 2 speak of the divorce of God from his people. J. Adams, who we all know and love as a pioneer in biblical counseling, Mm -hmm. actually J. Adams back in the 70s that started the biblical nuthetic counseling movement and wrote, what, 15 books on the subject? Uh, a year, it seemed uh, like. Yeah, yeah, he was cranking them out. Jay Adams, so here's a quote from Jay Adams, points out that, quote, if God himself became involved in divorce proceedings with Israel, it is surely wrong to condemn any and all divorce out of hand, end quote. In God's case, God divorced Israel and Judah for spiritual adultery, but this divorce was an act of mercy. His alternative was to put them to death and end the nation, and he didn't do that. And then one last thing, and then I'll I'll hush. Neuheiser points out, I think this is huge, Neuheiser, which is a book that uh, Steve Schwartz quotes from frequently. Uh, The book is titled Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. Neuheiser points out that God followed the two-step pattern of human divorce. The guilty party was guilty of gross covenant-breaking acts, and the innocent party chose to use those grounds to formalize the dissolution of the marriage. Mm. Yeah, you were going right to the, the, the jugular there. Those were, those were the quotes I was going to focus oh, yeah. on. Yeah, me too. But, um, <laughs> me too. Well, we can make <laughs> <Murray. laughs> I'm glad you're here, Murray. But he said, I would maintain that this is the only divorce in history in which one party is actually 100% innocent. 
you know, there's always, you know, it's never, it's never just one thing. It's never just one sided. There's two sides, but this one was definitely a one sided, uh, gross covenant breaking act. Um, Right. And and what I, what I think is instructive there is that word formalize, uh, where a marriage covenant has been destroyed by whatever means it was destroyed by, um, at that point, at that moment, you can say that the marriage covenant has has been disintegrated, mm-hmm. desecrated, dissolved. dissolved. Yeah. Um, now, what happens from there are up to the two parties involved. But what God did with Israel first and the Assyrian captivity and then Judah second with the Babylonian captivity and exile— the city was burned down, the walls were torn down, the temple was burned down and looted, right? All of that was God's direct hand of judgment on Judah and the result of his divorce. He was formalizing the fact that his covenant with them had been broken by them. Um, and, and in a sense, at that point in history, ir- irreparably. And so God said, well, what, what it's going to take to break Judah of her idolatry is a 70-year exile, and then I'm going to bring them back, and they will no longer worship these idols, you know, and and so it took a a whole generation of dying off, of purification, et cetera. So, but anyway, that that phrase there to formalize the dissolution of the marriage. And so, for example, if you've got serial adultery going on in a marriage, unrepentant serial adultery, uh, same partner, multiple partners, whatever, at some point, the innocent party has to recognize that this marriage no longer exists. This is no longer a marriage in God's eyes. Uh, and, and if this person is not going to repent, a divorce in that case only formalizes the reality. It, it, it brings legally to bear what is the reality of the situation. Right. In other words, there's no, you know, the, the extreme end, there's no such thing as an open marriage. That's a contradiction in terms. Right. Marriage, by definition, is closed. <laughs> uh, just like there's no such thing as a gay marriage. That doesn't exist. That, that's a contradiction in terms. So it would be with an open marriage or serial adultery. And, and I think sometimes it's a pride issue on the part of the person who is not guilty to come to terms with the reality of what's actually happening, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, well, and there can be a variety of reasons for that because you know the bottom line is, as he as he points over and over again, that divorce is messy business, no matter what the circumstances are, and it's emotionally devastating. Um, you know, anyone who's experienced divorce knows how. You know, in, in many cases, it's the most devastating thing they've ever experienced in their lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, even even if they're walking away from a marriage that has been, you know, <clears throat> decimated by their spouse. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I think is important that, you know, what he I, what I feel like Steve Schwartz is doing in his book is he's, he's exactly said this, but that there's there's two tendencies to fall off the horse on one side or the other of this issue. And one is to is to say no divorce for any reason, and he's cautioning against that. And he makes a point at some point, I'm not sure where it was, but but that a lot of churches and a lot of Christian leaders will give sort of tacit approval to the the two exception clauses and whatnot. But in actual practice, they condemn all divorce no matter what. And I think there is that kind of culture in a lot of conservative churches. I think that culture is changing, and I think books like this and other things like what Green Grudem and others have done has started to move away from that culture. I think that's a good thing. But the other caution, obviously, that he deals with is divorce for just any reason. And both are equally grievous things right. before the Lord. Right. And so that's why we've got to, to find that proper balance, you know, that Scripture, you know, provides for us. And, and it's not easy. 
no. uh, because you're dealing with such tangled issues. Yeah, and I, I think the temptation is, you know, I definitely was on the side of the no divorce, you know, with the two permissive clauses, but still kind of like in my mind, I don't know, you know, not in actuality, I, I didn't necessarily be in situations where it was practiced, except meeting with somebody for counseling and, and always on the side. Cause I, in my own, in my own mind and, and, and really ignorance, I guess, of this, this new opening of an idea of what biblical divorce would be in, that includes abandonment of uh, abuse and abandonment. But I think that, that, I wanted to err on the side of like, Hey, life is tough. We are, we live in a fallen world. This is your lot in life. It's sanctifying you now, not for, you know, there, then we, we have to pick apart the word abuse. So as we would do that, you know, but it's like, Hey, just stick it out. At the end of the day, if you can, uh, if you could separate for a little bit of time, which he goes into, that there's no such thing as a separation that you're that that would be divorce, you know. But hey, separate. You get help. He gets help, and then let's get back together. But don't get divorced. Don't get divorced. Right? Don't get divorced. And and to me, it was like uh, like falling on the side of of um, legalism versus easy easy believism or easy grace or truth versus grace. Right? And so I always felt in my own mind and ignorance, falling on that side was at least safer. It was safer, right? It's like I could, but for the, for the person not living it, of course, right? But just safer <laughs> right, right, for right. the name of Jesus, safer yeah. for the church, safer yeah. for this idea, and and so the the slippery slope that he talks about in here right. is it, that's where it just gets. Man, I think we've talked about this in our first session. Was we have to be very investigative, right? Very investigative because it is messy. And what do we really want? We do want reconciliation. We mm-hmm. we want yeah. God honoring, God glorifying reconciliation. Yes, but you mentioned the term serial adulterer. Is that even is there rec- is there possible reconciliation in a serial adulterer? Probably they're unrepentant because they're serial, right? right. Versus a one time adulterer. Is there grounds for divorce? Yes, but would we hope for forgiveness and reconciliation? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. right. And yes, and I think that, so, that takes us right to. to we yeah, finish? let me off okay. real quick. So I think the temptation would be as we're opening this new avenue, if you will, that we've uh, that is at least has opened my eyes, and I think all the nine elders. It's kind of been a new like, oh my gosh, we we agree with this, but how do we unfold this? Is that we just have to be very, very, very careful because the temptation uh, of, of what this could be and what mm-hmm. this could mean and what this could look like. You right. know? So I, I like the two words he uses, uh, page 72, and he's quoting from someone named Roberts. Um, and he makes a distinction between uh, treacherous divorce and disciplinary divorce. So that's kind of what mm-hmm. you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Treacherous divorce is divorce without biblical grounds with a spouse being discarded for little or no, little or no reason. Um, it's confusing that, you know, there's a huge difference between marriage is challenging and situations of abuse or normal sin in marriage and understanding that abuse is not normal. Mm-hmm. That's not normal sin in marriage. Okay, so... Uh, so you got to make these distinctions. So treacherous divorce would be divorcing for he bores me. He doesn't. I don't love him anymore. I don't like the way she looks anymore. Uh, they're unmet expectations, unmet expectations, all, all those yeah. kind of things. We'll get yeah. to some of that. That we all that we all experience. Yes, that we all experience. that's part of marriage. Yeah. Everybody could have a treacherous divorce <clears throat> if they wanted right. to. Versus disciplinary divorce. Um, he defines it is a formal withdrawing. Listen to this de- definition. Disciplinary divorce is the formal withdrawing of the privileges of marriage because of adultery, abandonment, or abuse. <clears throat> I, I love how that how that's worded. <clears throat> you're not you're not aggressive. You're not active in this. You're not seeking this. You're not pursuing it. It is a passive thing. It is a withdrawing. Mm-hmm. It is. I put myself out there. I was vulnerable. I was. I was here for you, and you either violated it through adultery or abandonment or abuse, and so I'm going to withdraw those privileges 
in response um, as as a as a possibility of of a response. <laughs> I want to go back to something that Murray said. You know, conflict in the Christian life is often the means by which God sanctifies us. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we see that all over, you know, First Peter, I think, uh, of, you know, the fiery trials that we go through are a form of refining us, you know, uh, taking the dross out of our, our life and, and purifying, you know, the gold, so to speak. Right. And, and I think marriage is, is one of the primary uh, areas where God is going to sanctify us, and it's through the fires of conflict. But I think the irony is that there's a there's a point at which adultery, abandonment, or abuse crosses the line of being a sanctifying con- level of conflict mm-hmm. to now being an irredeemable mm-hmm. level of conflict where you've crossed this line to the point where the conflict is no longer sanctifying but but destructive mm, that's to good. the marriage that's, that's, that's yeah it's not god glorifying sanctification yeah it's actually disobedience right. to yeah. god and the the covenant of marriage yeah, yeah. all and right it's tearing down i mean it's i think what you mean scott is that it's it's not building up sanctification right. is the building up in faith this is actually uh, like tearing down somebody over time right. yeah right and that tearing and, down, it can be physical it could be becomes emotional it can be a, a, a strain on your mind to a portion gets to the breaking point where they, they they begin to lose touch with reality ability to function on a day-to-day basis and, and and again I think I think for all of us I think for the majority of our hearers we've never been in an environment that was truly unrepentant, abusive mm-hmm. on, in an ongoing way. Maybe there's been, you know, moments, but I, I think once you get to, to grasp what, what abuse really is, what it looks like, what it does to a person, it crosses the line you're talking about, mm-hmm. where this, this is no longer something that a, that a human being can live in, can function in. Yeah. Um, to the point where people become suicidal, people want to die, mm-hmm. people want to kill themselves, they want to kill their partner who's abusing them. Yeah. You know, is it, I mean, here's your options. Is it better to get a divorce or to murder the person? Right. Right. I mean, in a real world, you have to make choices sometimes of the lesser of two evils. And, and in some cases, we all have a breaking point, and it would be much better for a person to divorce and leave than to resort to. My only out, my only recourse here is to kill this person, right? I mm-hmm. mean, and that happens. Oh yeah, it happens, oh, it's it a, happens it's a, a lot. It's a crazy <laughs> phenomenon, really. That that that's the out. The out is instead of just divorce, it's to murder. Yeah. You know, right. yeah, yeah, murder or suicide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. murder yeah. or suicide. Lot of times, I bet I've so never. I, I I don't think he addresses the statistics of that. But yeah, it's, yeah. it happens. Yeah, it happens a lot. So chapter nine, I think we can go quickly on guys and and maybe get to ten and eleven. Chapter yeah, nine is is called the great need for the whole counsel of God, and he, he basically says we can't just cherry pick one or two places. We need to right. hear from Moses, Jesus, Paul. Peter, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. everywhere in the Bible that speaks to marriage, uh, divorce, and remarriage, we need to take that into account. And so uh, that's really chapter chapter nine. Uh, chapter ten gets into really what we're trying to talk about today: the great need for grace and patience. Do I have some? Do I have some quotes that you wanted? Because I stole your, I stole everybody's <laughs> quotes last time. Uh, well, it's easier just to say that I was going to say the same thing. It's easier that, to say easier that. So, yeah. that. <laughs> I, I like the quote on page 79 where he says, uh, Christians have often put man-made hedges around the Bible's teaching on divorce to keep from transgressing God's standards. But this becomes no different than the Pharisees' oral tradition, uh, which came to be viewed, viewed as equal to or even above Scripture. Yeah. yeah, and that's kind of what I was saying. Is it's yeah. almost like, you know, I could be accused of being a Pharisee if mm-hmm. if I'm going to choose licentiousness or legalism. Uh, my personality tends to choose legalism. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. And mm-hmm. and and then hold that standard over other people as well. Right. 
which is it, it seems safer. It's not, right, right. Mm-hmm. but it seems safer. Right. You know, when neither when neither is actually the answer. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. we use phrases like, "Well, I'm taking the high road." Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take the high road here yeah. of, right. of scripture yeah. of yeah. no divorce ever and no remarriage ever. Yeah. It's like, well, it's not the high road if it's beyond what God if it's <laughs> says higher than the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I like what he says on top of page 80 here. Uh, it kind of goes in line with what we were just talking about. Um, Vander Lute. Lute. Lute goes on to comment that divorce for its own sake is selfish and sinful, but cruel and inhumane marriage is not pleasing to the Lord either. Mm-hmm. Christians should resist categorizing divorce as a unique, unredeemable form of evil. All things considered, as a bold statement, mm-hmm. brace yourself, hearers. <laughs> mm-hmm. All things considered, on occasion, divorce is the right thing to do. All things Not considered. just permissible. <clears throat> can actually right. be the right thing to yeah. do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and once again, you have the standard that God himself divorced Israel because it was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it was either that or kill them. You know, and yeah. that's what that's we were just cool talking about. Yeah. 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 And sometimes it's better to divorce someone than to kill them or to kill yourself. And it's an act of mercy. Yeah. It's an act of mercy. Uh, yeah. So if you think about this from a, from a love biblical standpoint, <clears throat> if, if a, let's say the man in a marriage has got such an anger problem and his spouse is the person who uh, no fault of her sets him off on a repeated Basis causes him to sin repeatedly, egregiously, you know, physical violence, mm-hmm. abuse, um, putting his hands around her throat, uh, fist to her face, smacking her in the face, uh, kicking her, what uh, physical, abusive violence. Could you not make an argument biblically that a loving thing to do for that person is to get away from them because your presence is tempting them, not your fault. But your presence is tempting them to evil. And they cannot, they've demonstrated over so much time, so much counsel, so much, you know, help that they cannot control themselves. And so, in my mind, to continue to live with that person is to put them in an impossible situation. That you're actually showing them love by getting away from them. Mm Mm-hmm. And eliminating their possibility <clears throat> of sinning against you in this way. I mean, that's what the criminal justice system does in, a, in effect. Like, we're going to lock you up because you've demonstrated you can't be a law-abiding citizen. This is for your own good, ideally, so that you cannot continue to murder people or steal from people or rape people. Um, because, obviously, that's bad for the people, for the victim, but it's also bad for you. Right? I mean, mm-hmm. sin yeah. is bad for the yeah. sinner. <laughs> right. And so our system says, well, we've got to put people away so they can't do certain things. I feel like divorce does that in certain circumstances. It stops the abuser. Hmm. You can't abuse me anymore mm-hmm. because I'm not here anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so th- that's just an important piece of this this puzzle, I think, uh, yeah. from biblical and the standpoint. physical, the the physical abuse is is pretty easy. Like you know, I mean, we, we, I don't think any of our listeners would argue with that. It's then when we get into that verbal slash emotional, emotional, we'd say right. is all abuse. But that right, that's where <laughs> boy, it just gets sticky. That's where it gets sticky. But even in the in in years past, even in evangelical circles, there have been those who have taught, yeah. That you can't, that even physical abuse is not grounds because it's not one of the not, one you, of the two. It's not. You, it doesn't fall under abandonment. Right. You stay there and, right. you, and you take it because wow. Jesus was physically abused. I mean, I think this has been taught worldwide. I think there's yeah. various cultures around the world that this would have been the case. I think mm-hmm. of some stories I heard from Tom Lunsford in Africa, uh, in the African Church, uh, that there, there was an edge to the African Church. You know, when the AIDS mm-hmm. epidemic started, the African church said, judgment of God, we're not mm-hmm. going to, no compassion for you. You know, yeah. and I think that same kind of mindset was in the in the context of, of spousal abuse. Mm-hmm. You know, he's head of the home. You must have provoked him. You must have got what you deserved. Uh, you got to stay put. And and so, um, yeah, so, some would even argue, for, you know, that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. The <clears throat> fundamentalist. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that was a, uh, I think that was a pre- predominant view Really, 
uh, throughout most of the 20th century, I would say, at least in modern evangelicalism, certainly up through the 70s and into the 80s. And then I think s- s- slowly you started to some, see, see some shift. And I think, you know, um, you know, 40 years later, there's there's even a more of a shift. But it's still an issue. It's still a problem. And um, for sure. Chapter 11, when divorce may be better than marriage. Hmm. So a common theme that he brings up again and again and again, and we've mentioned it on here, but it bears repeating, only the person in the home can fully grasp the realities of a nightmarish, tortured existence. And he talks about how God permitted divorce. <clears throat> Jesus quotes in Matthew nineteen eight. Jesus said to the Pharisees, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. <clears throat> so God was giving a permissive uh, allowance there f- because of the hardness of the hearts of men toward women and giving them a, a way to escape from that. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things he, yeah, he continuously brings up that causes should cause all of us to pause with our judgmental spirits and our criticism and our looking down upon is no one knows the reality of the situation but the person living it. Yeah. And no matter how much counsel there is, no matter how much they've told you, no matter how much you've even witnessed, it's still not the same as living it 24-7. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, that's just an extremely important point. Yeah. I think it's important here on, on page 92, this header, that God is the protector of women. Uh, uh, oftentimes, not not 100% of the time, but uh, an overwhelmingly uh, uh, prevalent is that men are the abusers and God is the protector of women. And so, uh, and so should we, <laughs> you know, as... as uh, image bearers we should protect women as well and just this theme that he he has these bullet points that god provided protection for a daughter sold into slavery in exodus 21 god provided safety for foreign women captured as prisoners of war in deuteronomy 21 god made freedom uh provisions for unloved wives in deuteronomy 24 god provided a defense for wrongly divorced women this is this the malachi 2:16 uh, this is God defending wrongly divorced women. And then God defended women against frivolous divorces for any reason from, uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. God provided women protection from hard hearts of wicked husbands in Matthew 19. That's what Jesus was saying. God, Moses, Moses allowed for divorce because of your hardness of heart. He was protecting women from your hard heartedness. And then God provided protection from an abandoning spouse in 1 Corinthians 7. I like what he says in in that same vein, what he says on page 92, that God makes provisions so that the consequences of sin do not have to be as bad as they could be. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and I just made a a side comment, you know, note to myself in this passage that to to keep an innocent party in an abusive marriage is to punish the innocent and let the abuser reign freely over them. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, you know what an egregious evil that yeah, is. Yeah, that's not the heart of God. Yeah. yeah. Right. So John Frame is a as a name well known in seminary circles and theological circles as a highly respected theologian, I believe, and uh, and has written uh, some massive books on the subject. There's a great quote from him here on page 92. It says, God determined that a prohibition of all divorce would be, for fallen people, unbearable. In other words, no divorce ever mm-hmm. would be unbearable mm-hmm. in a fallen world. Mm-hmm. And therefore, counterproductive for good social order. Sin would certainly lead to divorce. The law could not be expected to prevent that. The best thing that the law could accomplish would be to regulate divorce, to mitigate its oppressiveness and maintain the rights of those who have been cast aside. Mm-hmm. That's, like, that's what you're saying. Yeah. And the page before this has a, <clears throat> one of the most important sections in the whole book to me. Uh, bottom of page 91, he says, what about some level of peace and this willingness to, re- no, I'm sorry, what about when the unbelieving spouse is willing to remain 
because he is exerting abusive terrorist-like control over his wife and home. Okay, so this is the whole scenario we're talking about. Well, they mm-hmm. haven't abandoned. They haven't left. Right. Uh, okay, what about that, he asked. What about the types of abuse which do not leave bruises, but systematically destroy the life of the abuse victim through things like social isolation? You can't see your friends. You can't see your family members. Oof. You can't talk to your sisters. Uh, you can't go home to see your parents. Financial abuse. Uh, lording money over. Lording over. You can't spend money. Yep. Uh, you get no money. You have no allowance. Nothing. Yeah, especially but, the spouse that mm-hmm. stays home and takes care of the family, right? right. And doesn't actually have a, a the, an income. Right. Financial. Verbal mm-hmm. reviling, yep. which we'll, we'll talk about that more in the future. Yep. The verbal reviling. Threats, which are either direct or subtle. We didn't, we didn't even talk about that as a mm-hmm. form of abuse. Just the the, the idea of threats. Yeah, just of the living stronger, in fear. Uh, living right. in just constant fear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, direct or subtle. It could be body language. It could be making fists. It could be uh, if you do that again, I'm going to yeah, lock whatever. you in a closet. I mean, whatever. Mm-hmm. And other types of abuse. And so, yeah, uh, I mean that, that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about abuse. Talking about a terrorist like control. We're talking about uh, all these things of uh, dehumanizing another person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that are not leaving bruises. Right. right, that right. are not leaving bruises. I mean, they're bruising the soul, bruising the spirit. But that that absolutely, we advocate that that yeah. is abuse and falls under abandonment. Right? It re- reminds me of the you know I, I tell the story of Louis Zamperini uh, in in my book Defeating Evil and and talk about how the Japanese method of of prison dealing with torturing prisoners was basically to dehumanize them to so you know ground them into the dirt as just total scum of the earth that Mm. they didn't even want to continue to live Mm. and and it it just suddenly occurred to me that that's what happens in a a lot of marriages Mm -hmm. uh that it's just as bad as being in a japanese prison camp yeah Yeah. Yeah. and we we you know we've said over and over and it it just it it's true Typically, we're talking about men doing this to women, but we've seen in our culture in this, you know, in a, in a, in a feminist-driven, egalitarian culture that women are doing it to men mm-hmm. as well, yeah. you know? Yeah, and I think it's important for us to remember, like, he, I mean, this header on, on page 93 is that marriage was made for humanity and not humanity for marriage. That's good. Marriage was made for human flourishing, not we weren't made to f- for marital flourishing, you know, it's good. It's for our good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, God made Eve for Adam because it was not good for him to be alone. Um, so marriage is meant to serve us as people, not, you know, we don't just need to keep putting up with, with abuse and, uh, yeah, these untenable it's situations. A gift. It's a gift it of a God, gift. right? And again, exactly. Yeah. He says, he says in, in the second paragraph there, Toby, at times divorce is simply an act of mercy that while not reflecting God's ideal for humanity is merely the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we should, we're at 34. We should, we should kind of move on to the no free passes. I think yes, this is I what agree. everybody's waiting <laughs> yes. for. I agree. Yeah. We got to get chapter 12 squeezed in and we can yeah. call it a day. So, chapter 12 is no free passes, unbiblical excuses for divorce. And this is where he talks about uh, where, you know, the, the treacherous divorce would be uh, just our discomfort, our uh, things that, that are far away different from abandonment, abuse, or adultery. Uh, we're mutually in, we're incompatible. We just don't get along. We fell out of love. Right, it's uh, the irreconcilable differences. Irreconcilable right? differences. That, that blanket excuse. Yeah, that ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he has yeah. He has overall categories yeah, for gives, some of these. He gives like each of ones, them, yeah. You know, one, one set of categories is under the topic of greed. Yeah. Other would be under the topic of unmet expectations. Others would be under self-centered contract view of marriage uh and then and then emotional uh various emotional type of issues yeah. well let's give some examples of that so under greed 
uh, would be an example of greed could include, I deserve for him to make more money. I deserve to have sex anytime I want. I deserve more fulfillment outside my marriage. I deserve to spend weekends with my friends without her complaining. I deserve to be treated like the king of the house. I deserve to be spoiled like the princess of the house. Mm -hmm. He doesn't deserve my forgiveness. I'm keeping that to myself. That would it's, be greed. Yeah. It's right. I deserve more. Yeah, me, 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 yeah. me, right? Unmet expectations. This is the key. What I've seen in in my uh, time in, as a pastor in biblical counsel or not biblical marriage counseling has been uh, just a blanket. Wait, your your marriage counseling wasn't biblical. <laughs> Could have been. Probably had, probably had a lot of Murray in it. <laughs> okay, Stop good, it. It was good, supposed good, to be. Couldn't let that slip. It was supposed to be. But unmet expectations, right? I mean, that unmet expectations, expectations is a killer of marriage, mm, right? Yeah. Because marriage is a series of unmet expectations because yeah. you're taking two people from two different worlds, two different yeah. – um, value, how they were raised, all those things, and, you're, and God's saying, okay, now I want you to be one flesh. I want you to represent me as this yeah. one flesh. Well, we're like, wait a minute, I thought marriage was going to be this. I thought, of course, yeah. we yeah. think that, right? And and the dating, the 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 what dating does to even get you to the point to marriage is is really, you know, it's the it's the rose rose colored glasses, mm -hmm. right? And then now let the work, you know, you look over at your spouse about day five of honeymoon, and you smell their <laughs> breath, and you go, oh wow, now the work starts, right? <laughs> so unmet expectations. I'm not happy, and it's his or her fault. He's not the same person I married. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, of man. course he's not. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah. You're not the same person. <laughs> yeah. All changing. Yes. All I'm not sexually satisfied <laughs> or attracted anymore. She can't or she can't or won't cook. He doesn't do things. If she can't cook, it's probably good that she won't cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Count that as a mercy of God, a blessing. Yes. yes. And a blessing. Uh, he doesn't do things the way I wish he would. He's unattractive now. Well, he probably was unattractive when you married him. He's unattractive now. She's a slob and won't clean up after herself. Mm -hmm. You know, those are just little examples. Yeah. But isn't that so true, right? And people, what we would just more than caution against is we are not advocating for this blanket of divorce. We are pro marriage, right? We are right. fighting for marriages, mm. man. We pray if there's yeah. not, if there's one thing we pray about consistently in our elders meetings and in our pastor's staff time of prayer is for marriages, mm -hmm. right? We are pro marriage. So these yeah. little things of greed and unmet yeah. expectations, we're saying, man, those are not Right. reasons I've, for divorce. I've said this before on the podcast and I, I stole it from a friend of mine, but he said, when you, when we get married, we have a picture of what we want our spouse to look like, you know, or those expectations. We have a picture and over time we will either embrace the person and tear up the picture or we'll embrace the picture and tear up the person. Mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. You know? And that's what I think that all falls under this unmet expectations. And then the emotional is, <clears throat> I'm just going to, everything's based on how I feel. Right. Yeah. I'm just, it's, I'm just yeah. driven by feelings and moods and happiness and grumpy and whatever, and I've fallen out of love and the spark is gone. Well, guess what? If you stay married long enough, everybody's going to feel that at some season. There's going to be seasons of that. Right. And uh, it's, okay, now what do you do? I, I think these things are, you know, in, in, a, in a sanctifying kind of way, back to mm -hmm. marriage is designed mm -hmm. to sanctify us. It's really good that these things happen because it, it strips away what is the foundation of my marriage when yeah, all yeah. is said and done. Yeah. Is, it, is it a covenant and a commitment to this person, um, or is it based on circumstances and the feelings? Because feelings? Yeah. Right. our feelings are going to come and go. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, yeah. I can't remember who said it, but it was like the flower of, our, of love is going to wither and then come back seasonally, you know? It's going to ebb and flow, right. but you know it's it's the covenant that sustains marital love. It's not love that sustains the covenant. There you go. When uh, a quick story when when uh, first went into ministry, Katie and I had been married for maybe four four or five years, I guess, and had just a just a terrible marriage and not fruit bearing at all, not God honoring, not other honoring at all, and went into ministry. Still struggle, and uh, 
I was meeting with a, a fellow brother in Christ and, and he said they'd been married, him and his wife had been married, you know, 30 years or something at the time. And, and he said, you know, my wife and I, and they're great, just a great godly couple. And he said, you know, we're really more partners, you know, we're really more partners. And I, and when I first heard that, I thought, well, that, that kind of stinks. Like your wife, you're just your partner. Like you guys are like just teammates, you know, that kind of stinks. And it, and now looking back literally 20 years later, 15, 18, 20 years later, that's exactly where Katie and I have grown to is we really are more partners but in a good sense, like our marriage is healthier now than it's ever been. We we definitely view th- our future years uh, to be the best that that are that are coming for us, and and it's all good. And it's really we're more partners. Yeah, but we're not we're not like roommate partners, roommate, yeah. but we're yeah. partners, you know. And it really I've been like, yeah, that's it. Is it? And and it was really getting rid of your unmet expectations, you know, just getting or getting rid of your expectations and accepting the person for they are and going, okay, this is how God made you. This is how God made me. Now let's, let's do this, you know? So, yeah. so you said we're pro marriage and I think it'd be a good way to, to end this with this little list on page 100 as to help our marriages, to help us, to help our listeners. Um, the kind of questions that you need to think about if you're struggling in your marriage, kind of questions a marriage slash biblical counselor should be asking mm-hmm. or statements that should be made like this. Uh, the Lord can help me to be patient. What can I do to be a better wife or a better husband? What would the Lord have me learn through this? I like this one. Lord, I thank you for these 10 things about my spouse. Or Lord, help me to see my own selfishness and forsake focusing only on my needs. Mm -hmm. That's good. You've used that before, haven't you, Murray? I want you to make a list of the things that you appreciate about the other one. Yeah. Yeah. That that last one I think has been most helpful for me personally in my marriage. You know, help me to see my own selfishness and forsake mm-hmm. focusing only on my own. Um. So so you I'd know it's like we're so selfish. Probably true you know, for me and, as well. And marriage realizes that you know marriage reveals Exposes that. It, yeah. 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 And um, you know, we're just incredibly selfish people. I know I found myself in a, many a marriage counseling situation <clears throat> where they're actually going at each other in the session, right? <laughs> and at some point, I just stop and go, why did y'all get married? Can y'all remind, my, remind me, remind each other? Like, why did you marry him? Why mm-hmm. did you marry her? Boy, and it's it, it that's a it. Gra- yeah. Yeah, just yeah. diffuses it. People just stop in their tracks, and, and they go back, and it's always a good thing to rehearse. So I, made, I made this choice freely. <laughs> Whoa! I didn't. Well, there was some stuff. I don't know if it was from this <laughs> book. I don't think it was the trash. book, but it was something in light of all this conversation we've been having about marriages. But if somebody in a counseling situation said, "You know, you guys, it's just not going to work out. You guys don't even need to come back and whatever," and they're like, "What?" <laughs> they looked at each other like, "You can't say that. We're going to prove him wrong." And like the marriage was restored. You know, they're like, "We'll prove you yeah. wrong. We are supposed to be married." Yeah. <laughs> Melissa has what she calls the million dollar violin, violin lesson. And uh, it's it's the one where you say, I don't think you should come back anymore. <laughs> yeah. And because you're not practicing, yeah, you're, not you're practicing. wasting your parents money. And and they'll and sometimes they'll, you know, step it up, step it up. And they become, you know, really great musicians. And, you know, but it's that but most of the time you need they, to go. They they you need to leave. Right if now. it's a kid, Just, yeah, they're like, yeah, thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, every now and then. <laughs> It works. Uh, it? Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Scott, will you close us in prayer? Father, again, we just thank you uh, for this book and uh, for the rich conversation that it has allowed us to, to have to discuss these important issues. Lord, we continue to pray. Lord, that you will open our eyes, open the eyes of our listeners, Lord, to really uh, grapple with, with these important uh, issues related to marriage and divorce and abuse, abandonment, and uh, and Lord, we pray that you would, above all else, strengthen our marriages, Father, uh, strengthen the marriages of our church, that they might bring honor and glory to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast. We want to be a resource for you and answer the biblical, theological, or pastoral questions that you may have. Send them to us via email at questions at curvillebiblechurch.org 
or leave us a text or voicemail at 830-321-0349.